So living to 100, would Canadian pensions be sustainable? And in a couple of years, I may come back to you and say, working to 100, <laughs> would it be sustainable? Because, uh, strangely enough, uh, there was an article uh, from BBC uh, two weeks ago speaking of the kind of work you could do when you are age 100 years old. But let's, before going to this topic of working to 100, let's look at the reality that we have, especially for longevity improvements. So, at retirement, most Canadians will receive an income from one of the three tiers of our system, the Old Age Security Program, the Canada-Quebec Pension Plans, and employer-sponsored pension plans, including individual uh, savings accounts. The first two pillars replace, uh, today, about 40% of pre-retirement earnings for full careers individuals with earnings at the average level. Such replacement rate is consistent with the goal set in the International Labor Organization Convention number 102. The diversification of the Canadian system through its mix of public and private pensions and different financing approaches, and I would stress different financing approaches, mitigates a multitude of risks to which the individual's retirement incomes are exposed. This uh, table illustrates the importance of various sources of income in protecting Canadian seniors from poverty. Because of for, for the overarching goal of any system is first to alleviate uh, poverty when you are old. The proportion of seniors with income before taxes below the threshold set at 25% of the YMP, so the average wages, is analyzed. If all types of income are taken into account, 24% of single seniors and 5% of couples have income below the threshold. It is worth noting the significant difference between singles and couples. The second line, if the GIS income is removed, the number of low income seniors doubles. By removing all types of third pillar retirement savings and working income, these numbers double again. Finally, Removing the CPP puts all Canadian seniors to income level below the threshold. In particular, it means that even if the basic OAS benefit serves as a foundation of the Canadian retirement income system, it is not sufficient on its own to lift seniors from poverty. So how the Canadian retirement system responds to aging and what lies ahead? The latest actuarial report on the old age security was tabled before Parliament in August 2014. The projections of the report reflect the aging of the population and the resulting growth in the number of beneficiaries. It is projected that this number will increase by 60% in the next 15 years and double by 2050. A similar trend is observed with respect to the dollar amount of total OAS expenditures. However, the total expenditures as a percentage of the GDP are expected to start to decrease after 2033. And the reason is simple, is because OAS benefits increase with inflation, and inflation grows slower than wages and the GDP. The second pillar of our system is the Canada Pension Plan and Quebec Pension Plan for workers working in, uh, in Quebec. So the latest actual report was tabled before Parliament in December 2013, and we are currently working on uh, the next one. And the report states that with the legislated contribution rate of 9.9%, contributions are more than sufficient to cover expenditures until 2023. So we have uh, positive cash flows and since uh, 2000. Starting from 2023, a proportion of investment income is required to pay annual expenditures. Results contained in this report confirm that the 9.9 contribution rate is sufficient to financially sustain the plan and to accumulate assets of uh, around 300 billion by 2020. Now, as we speak, CPF, CPPIB has accumulated 60 billion more in assets than projected in the last actual uh, report. So we are in a very good posi position today. But remember, Markets go both ways, up and down. So why to worry about the aging and the Canada Pension Plan? 
The reason is the uncertainty embedded in mortality projections. And life expectancies at birth in 2013 are projected to be 86 years for men and 89 years for women, quite a long way from 100. At the same time, the report identifies high uncertainty related to future mortality improvements. In particular, if life expectancies continue to increase at the current rate, especially for ages 75 to 89, the long-term mortality assumptions will need to be adjusted which in turn will create an upward pressure on the minimum contribution rate calculated by the actuary. Under the high cost scenario, the con contribution rate could go to 10.2% if life expectancies increase six years more than current life expectancies at age 65 by 2050. Increasing a life expectancy is one of the main reasons of population aging. So for the rest of my presentation, I will concentrate on past and projected trends in the mortality of the Canadian population. So this table shows a slowdown in the rate of increase in life expectancy at birth between the first and later parts of the 20th century. Over the last 20 years, ending in 2009, about 60% of the uh, increase in life expectancy for men has come from reduction of mortality rates at age 65 and over. And the 60% is what? This is the three year over 5.1. And you see for a woman, two over three. So numbers are smaller, but the uh, impact of the reduction of mortality rates for people age 65 uh, and over is, is there. And we think that this trend will continue in, uh, in the future. Now, in the most recent CPP mortality study released in June of this year, we analyzed the source of increases in life expectancy for those 65 and older. Over the past 10 years, a greater share of increase in life expectancy is coming from seniors age 75 and over. So the, right now, the, the mortality rates of the 65, 74 are quite, are quite low, and we see a push of further reduction for older uh, people. Since the early 70s, male and female life expectancy at age 65 has increased by about five years to 19 and 22 years, respectively. It represents a pace of increase of more than a year per decade. The gap between female and male life expectancies at age 65 has also uh, narrowed. And what you, what you could see in this graph is, of course, from the first part of the century, almost no increase, and then the, the, the second part of the century, a significant increase in life expectancy at age 65. So then the question is, why? Well, the significant increases in Canadian life expectancies at age 65 that have been observed over the last few decades, over the last 30 years, can, can be explained in great part by the improvements in mortality related to heart diseases. So you see, oops, sorry. You see this line here, and mortality rates because of heart diseases, how it dropped very fast for men, and the same for women since uh, 2007. Uh, since uh, some time, I would say, 2007 for women, the uh, main cause of death after age 65 is now uh, cancer. So in the future, we could expect that reductions in mortality from cancer may hopefully become an important factor. So, so let me pause for a minute. When we set assumptions for mortality, we look at three factors. First, the level of mortality rates by age. It is obvious, but obvious, when you look at this, you see that probability of dying in this group is much, much lower than when you are in this group. So we first look at age groups. The second thing we look is the pace of reduction in the past and why. So that's what we call the mortality improvement rates. And the third one is the international comparison. And we, discate, we dissect the information by causes of death and by country. And what we're looking at is the top eight or nine countries with the lowest mortality rates where population is at least eight million people. Now, as you can see, while there is not much difference in mortality rates among 
uh, among countries for age groups from 65 to 84 year. Canada has still some room to further reduce mortality rates and close the gap with the top countries for ages below age 85. So there's still room for Canada to further reduce mortality rates in these two age groups. As we move to older age groups, Canada one of the top three countries with the lowest mortality rates along with France and Japan. The question is then, will Canadian seniors ever reach the level of mortality of Japanese or diet and lifestyle differences will always result in some gaps in uh, mortality? And indeed, if you look at the uh, age group 90-94 uh, for men only, uh, we have uh, we experience lower mortality rates than in Japan. So the question is then, if we are one of the best, could we further reduce the mortality rates? So this is the famous uh, heat map, and what it, what it is is it shows the pace of reduction or increase, but mainly reduction in mortality rates over the past. Uh, uh, about uh, over, uh, what you have on the left side of the vertical line is history and then the future for the next, uh, uh, the next 30 years. And every uh, area where you see dark blue, light blue, there's a, it means that there, are, uh, there was almost no improvement or no reduction in mortality rates. While in the area where you have uh, black, uh, red, and dark oranges, it means that mortality rates have reduced uh, a lot. So what you see in this graph, purple spots, means that actually mortality rates have increased, not decreased during that period. So and this is due to uh, mainly to accidents in that period. Here you see the impact of AIDS. So there was uh, an increase in mortality rates. And guess what? When we found the cure, then mortality rates increase at a faster rate than, than in the past. The last thing I want to point out here is, uh, and we also, also we have this cohort effect that is present for men in Canada, but absent for uh, women. One thing to, that I would like to uh, remind you is when you see this color here, or this color here, and this same color here, it's the same reduction, but it's not applied to the same mortality rate. So mortality improvement rates are only one in, uh, important information for uh, the puzzle of uh, uh, projecting mortality rates. We do, uh, of course, analysis by age group. And here, and in the appendixes, in the appendix, you have all the age group uh, analyzed. And here, what you have is the age 75, 84. And the, the, you see the trend from 108 deaths per 1,000 in, in 1929 to 43 deaths per 1,000. What you have in the box here is the top five causes of death in that age group. So uh, many, uh, cancer, heart diseases, cerebrovascular, lower respiratory, and diabetes. And you also have a comparison with US, such that Canada, we, have a, we experience mortality rates at 17% lower than in US. And the main reason is because heart diseases and uh, lower respi respiratory uh, diseases. And what we have seen over the past uh, uh, 80 years, so uh, roughly a reduction of 40% during these two periods. So we project a re further reduction of 40% uh, by 2049. Uh, so I have a question for you. What is the top country in this age group in the world? Lowest mortality, Lowest mortality rate in, uh, in age uh, 75, 84. Sorry? Uh, they are improving fast, but not that fast. So it's Japan. And the main reason is because heart diseases and lower uh, mortality rate because of cancer. And we, although we are experiencing here 43 deaths in Canada, in uh, Japan it's 36 uh, deaths per 1,000. Then the second one is France at 39. 
And UK is just uh, slightly better than US at 50 deaths per uh, 1,000. And of course, we have different countries and different age group with the uh, lowest uh, uh, mortality rates. Now, if you have to bring something with you, let's say a key takeaway of this presentation, is th this is the, the, the slide that you should uh, look at it. Does someone believe that men will outlive women in the future? Don't be shy. You could, uh, <laughs> and even if you don't have a mic, you just, we, it's a small room with a small uh, uh, audience. And uh, indeed, it happened in the history of humanity that uh, uh, men were outliving women. And it happened during periods, and it's still the case in five sub-Saharan countries, where uh, delivering a baby in a very bad health, uh, health condition makes that uh, mortality rates of women are uh, much higher. But the minute you uh, make uh, sure that uh, women could deliver babies in uh, good sanitary conditions, uh, mortality rates of women have uh, always been uh, lower than, than men. Now, this slide is what? We look at the uh, reduction by causes of death over the past 15 years. So 4.6 year for men, 4.1 for women, cancer 1.3, 0.2 for, for women, other causes 1.7, 0.7. Of course, over the past 15 years, the improvements for men were much higher than for women. And if you project this trend forever, it means that in only 11 years, Canadian men will live longer than women. Worse than that, it means that at the end of the projection period, men will outlive women by five years. So this is just, just as a reminder that setting future assumptions only on recent experience, even its 15 years, uh, may lead to unintended results. I will skip this one, but this uh, shows really the rectangularization of the survival curve or the compression of uh, mortality. And I will go to, I think, something more important. Uh, at the beginning, I talk about uh, living to 100. So can we live beyond age 100? Well, the CPP report projects that the number of Canadian centenarians will increase ninefold between 2010 and 2050. So 900 percent. But look at the number of people, still small number. Why? Because obviously you know the math. If you start with a very low number, you will get a huge increase. And a, a couple of weeks ago, someone decided to calculate the increase of the 105. Of course, they got huge increases because there's almost no one alive uh, at 105. Now, the point here is that for Canada, what is important, I think, is the number. We have already 300,000 people age 90 plus, and most of them are fragile, are frail. Some are very in good health, health condition, but the, the, the thing is that this number will soon surpass one million, and these people need long-term health care. So for me, the issue is not the people 100 years old, but more the people older than 90 years old. Now, this uh, next slide, I like it very much because it shows in a nutshell the difference between Canada, US, and UK in terms of projections. And it's the probability of living to age 90 for uh, Canada, US, and UK. So when you look at this graph, what is the age with the highest probability to reach 90 years old? 90 or 89, because you, have, you are already alive at that age. And if you look later in the appendix, you could look at 100, and you will see this uh, uh, this drop here is much more dramatic for uh, when you approach 100. So it means that mortality rates in this age group are still very high. And you see later on for, uh, with the projections that baby born in, uh, in 2012, uh, we think that it will be uh, slightly more than 50%, while UK are a bit more, I would say, more aggressive than us. And we think that for those age 20, uh, 
uh, in 2012, 50% of the, those people will live to, uh, to past the 90. How many? Three minutes? Three. Okay. So then I have time to do something else. This is the same graph, but now the probability of living to uh, 80 for Canada, US, and UK. You see here that we are slightly lower than, uh, than UK. And you may think, well, no need for adjustment. Well, I may surprise you, but maybe in the next report, we will further strengthen this assumption here. We will probably touch a bit about uh, on the probability of living to 90, but certainly, we won't touch on this one, even if we seem to be very far from UK. It remains to be seen if the mortality rates for those age 90 plus will uh, drop at the level expected by uh, UK. But again, I think when I go back to the uh, slide of 90 years old, I think UK has a good point. Uh, we might be wrong, they might be right, and then obviously the cost of the Canada Pension Plan is underestimated. Retirement, I will conclude with uh, this slide, retirement is expensive and will become even more expensive in the future with improved longevity. Projected mortality rates after uh, 2030 are highly uncertain, especially for people older than age 90. It is a professional duty of the actuary to examine all available information in order to develop best estimate mortality assumptions. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>